Okay, uh, Debbie Samick asked me to come talk to you about the huge mess, I mean improvements we're making to your campus. Um, I have to correct something Jim said. I am part of a team of 15 people that are destroying, I mean improving the campus. Uh, my primary client here is the Office of Facilities Management and they're responsible for the road closures out there. So if you need to direct complaints, it's facilities management, go to UD Dallas's website. Uh, okay, uh, I've got a lot of material to go through. Um, I am sort of the poster boy for uh, ADD or Ritalin. So if I start talking too fast, uh, Matt has permission to use the remote on my shock collar. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, I've got a lot of material to cover. We'll, we'll try to keep it constructive. Okay, so I want to talk to you about a number of items. Uh, the main thing is I have to explain to you who OFPC is and what they do so you'll understand the debacle. I mean, again, the uh, improvements we have going on campus. Uh, I, I want to walk you through a brief history of the, uh, this campus because it's, it's had an interesting one. It, it, it hasn't followed the standard growth path. Uh, I want to look at some of the reasons why this university is growing as fast as it is. Uh, look at some recently completed construction projects. Show you we've got what we've got going currently, and then what's on the, uh, on the futures list. Okay, so who is OFPC? OFPC manages capital improvement projects, four million dollars and up, for all the UT system campuses. Uh, that leaves the facilities management group free to manage the smaller projects, and there's a lot more of them. So actually, we get the better end of the deal. I have less projects to manage; they just have more money involved with them. Uh, we, we provide comprehensive start-to-finish services to our client, which again is UT Dallas. Um, our our uh, group is centrally program managed, but it is uh, regionally project managed. And what I mean by that is we have a large central office, but we also have regional offices where our staff are permanently based on campuses. And in my case, um, I'm a UT system employee, but I've been permanently based on this campus the uh, roughly eight years that I've been working for the system. Uh, we do start to finish, which means we get involved in the early programming, hiring of architects, uh, bidding out of work, hiring of contractors, management of the construction process. Uh, we go all the way through the one-year warranty on the building, and we also work with the campus to deal with latent defects, which can occur in a building uh, up to 10 years after it's completed. Okay, so again, I mentioned we're organized around regional project teams. Uh, our campus is our individual campuses are our clients. Uh, our, our philosophy is that we, we want to provide um, a, a comprehensive management of any new projects and do it in a consistent way from campus to campus. One of the advantages we have about being a, a large organization is we have the ability to share lessons learned throughout all of our campuses. Uh, I'm going to share some incidents we had out here that will show you how, just how important it is that that kind of information be shared. Obviously, uh, Dr. Kennelly was talking about the importance of uh, safety, uh, you know, construction safety is a huge factor, uh, especially when you're moving at the pace that we're moving right now. Okay, so our staff, the, the folks that we typically hire for project managers are uh, professionally trained as architects, engineers, uh, construction managers. Not all of us are registered, quite a few of us are. Uh, one of the reasons we do that is it gives us credibility with the architects that we're working with. Uh, we, we have, have an interesting uh, convoluted relationship here in that we act as the owner's designated representative for construction contracts, which means I interface with the different departments in the university to uh, our, our project management staff to, to help plan these projects and then administer them. Uh, but we also have to control change. And at a university, uh, how successful do you think we are at that? It's almost impossible, particularly when things are, are uh, growing as fast as they are. We also provide project reporting. We're a state organization, so we're subject to Public Record Act, so there's a lot of transparency in what we do and how we operate. The other thing about the way our uh, OFPC is set up is our staff is paid by a management fee that's assessed to our construction projects. So if we can't manage projects, they can fire us. And uh, in fact, they will if we don't manage things properly. So we have, an, uh, we have a, the same kind of incentive that a private sector firm would have as far as we need to be profitable, we need to make sure we're, we're providing good services, uh, or we, need, we get to go look for other jobs. OK, so let me talk to you a little bit about the capital improvement program. This is UT system-wide. This is all of the work that we have going on, on all 15 of our campuses. 
Uh, right now, it's a current of nine, uh, current total of 92 projects for a total of 5.4 billion dollars. Uh, that's just an unbelievable amount of work, um, and, and we have roughly 150 uh, people to manage that. Okay, so general project management are, is, is probably our primary service. We do uh, budgeting and, and, and administration. One of the things that we have is a detailed database of building costs by type going back 30 plus years, uh, which means we have a really uh, we have really good tools that we can use to help estimate. Uh, what it's going to cost for future projects. Now, uh, all of that kind of goes out the window when you have uh, an economy that's booming like it is right now. Uh, if you look at the start to finish on a project, it may take three to five years from initial conception, uh, business plan to completion of the finished building. That's a lot of time for a lot of escalation and cost. Uh, we try to plan contingencies into our budgets with uh, careful stewardship and um, tell the truth and love to our client about what they can and can't afford. Uh, that doesn't work too well with Dean Percool. He likes to push the envelope. Uh, the addition that we completed for him last year uh, included shelf space, uh, unfinished interior space on the fourth floor, the third floor, and part of the second floor because he wanted to get the most building for the buck. And against the odds, we successfully built that entire building out with all the contingency money, and we uh, scraped across the finish line with uh, paint fumes. Uh, but he did, in fact, you know, he's visionary and uh, he, uh, he got what he wanted. Okay, we've, uh, our delivery methods are aligned with the PMI uh, PMBOK framework. Uh, what I mean by that is we actually have a program management, our project management office that set out to align our practices with, uh, with the uh, framework. Now that's interesting uh, because we're also subject to a lot of regulatory controls that may or may not align with, with that, that guideline, but that's basically how we operate. Okay, okay, so this is a map of the state showing where, where we are. We have, uh, um, as I said, 15 institutions. Uh, when you look at that o overall figure uh, for uh, uh, project construction costs, a vast majority of that was taking place in UT, uh, MB, and Galveston. A lot of that was uh, rebuilding uh, following Hurricane Ike. Uh, on this campus, though, we've had a steady and consistent rate of construction going in, as you can see if you've been around the campus or been forced through any of our many paddle shoots. Uh, we're trying to give the Fort Worth uh, stockyards a run for their money. Okay, so uh, again, I mentioned we use centralized program management, localized project management. Um, uh, we're pretty much using project charters. I have to say that uh, we we encountered a lot of resistance to the use of project charters, primarily from people like me who didn't understand what they were. And you know, as I got educated in PMI processes and then went after my PMP, I went, oh, wait a minute. This gives me the authority to do my job. I, I should be the one championing this. So uh, fortunately, uh, once the light bulb went off here, uh, I think Dr. Kennelly was talking earlier about resistance to change. Architects don't know anything about that. I mean, we're not resistant to change. Okay, uh, I mentioned lessons learned presentations. Uh, I've got a few woven into this presentation I'm going to talk to you about. Um, the biggest problem with lessons learned is nobody really likes to air their dirty laundry, but uh, it's critically important that other people not repeat your mistakes. I, for one, am very happy to learn from other people's mistakes without repeating them. I've got enough of my own. Okay, so um, I've got a few slides in here that were put together from one of our senior project managers, Tom Lund. He's, uh, his title's a misnomer. He's in charge of all of the OFPC managed projects on this campus, and last time I checked, that would be called a program manager. But uh, maybe our titles haven't caught up with our job responsibilities. Anyway, this campus started uh, back in the early 60s uh, as the Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. It was, uh, it was founded by the founders of Texas Instruments which uh, explains why you see the names on the buildings that you see out here. They, they, they uh, were successful in, in getting this started, and it quickly took off. Uh, it, it became the uh, Southwest Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, the original building, which is now called the Founders Building, is the one you see in the picture there. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. What I really want to focus on is how fast the university's uh, grown. Okay, so these are enrollment statistics. Uh, if you look at when they started, in, in between 69 and 75, only graduate students were allowed to enroll. 
By 74, they had 700 students. Wow. Um, in 1975, they started allowing college juniors and seniors uh, to be admitted. Uh, and then, of course, we have full undergraduate programs now. So most universities grow top or bottom up. This one grew top down. Uh, I guess that was part of the uh, innovative thinking of the time. Uh, so by 2000, uh, enrollment was up to 11,000. It was still basically a commuter school here up until about uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, we started building dorms in 2009. Uh, we've completed five of them. There's now roughly 2,200 beds available on this campus. The university also has a number of uh, uh, apartment complexes over on uh, Waterview. Okay, so enrollment this past year was 23,000, roughly 23,000, and the projections for fall enrollment this year are 25,300. So we've been seeing a steady growth rate of 7 to 10% every year. What does that mean? It means we've built 3 million square feet of new building space, new classroom space on this campus in eight years, and we're still just as far behind as we were when we started. It's growing that fast. Um, I think that's called treading water. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick diagram that kind of shows when the various buildings were built. Uh, this campus was originally a cotton field, and what you ended up with was a bunch of buildings, uh, most of it w w which was the popular kind of brutalist heavy concrete architecture in the 70s, surrounded by roads. It was not a pedestrian-friendly place. Okay, so this, uh, this slide shows you uh, the next round of buildings. Uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, between 79 and 87, there was no new construction, no new buildings on this campus. Boy, has that changed. Okay, so this is about the time I got here. We had just finished the uh, warranty, one-year warranty expiration on the Inserl building, uh, and we started putting in a lot of these other buildings. Uh, we've, we've seen, seen a steady growth rate when, uh, since, since then. I had roughly a year uh, of, of quiet time before my project load went from one active construction project to anywhere between three to five. One of the interesting things about the way we manage our projects, I'm an RCM, uh, resident construction manager, which means I pretty much manage the construction side and the warranty side of a project. Uh, some of our PMs take it start to finish, but um, my background was construction administration, so that was a logical uh, use of my, my experience and skills. Uh, but what we do is any, we have our entire staff, including our inspectors, review progress drawings during design. Uh, we get FM involved early on in the design process. Uh, and that really helps, but it adds to the workload and adds to the complexity. Okay, so this is the next phase. This is, this is kind of where we are now and where we're, we're going in the next couple of years. I'm going to show you some larger slides with more details on these projects. Uh, again, what I'm just trying to get across to you is how fast it's grown. And of course, you know, what's one of the consequences of fast growth is increased risk. Okay, so what's driving growth here? Uh, you know, first of all, as Jim can attest to, uh, they're providing a really high quality level of education here. The explosive uh, growth of the School of Management and Executive Education Department especially is uh, evidence of that, that high quality education. There's a lot of demand. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no arguing that the 2009 uh, downturn in the economy uh, definitely boosted college enrollment statewide. If there's no jobs, might as well go back to school. Uh, quest for Tier 1 status. Uh, you know, right now we have three Tier 1 institutions in uh, Texas. I believe it's Texas A&M, main campus, uh, UT Austin, and uh, what's the other one? Rice? Rice University. Uh, so we're looking to be number four here. Um, and the way Tier 1 is established, uh, I'll get to a, a, a screen on that, uh, but the primary way it's established is by being able to track researchers for grant money. In fact, if you build it, they will come. If we don't have the space to house the researchers, we can't attract them here. Uh, this was largely a commuter school. If you look at all the landscape work that's going on, the, new, the central drive right in front of the uh, school management building, uh, we've taken steps to turn this from a commuter campus into a more traditional uh, pedestrian friendly campus where at least you can get across campus without tire marks. Uh, classroom of the future, uh, the fact of the matter is technology is changing so quickly that the way we teach is having to adapt and that consequently is affecting how we uh, how we design buildings. Okay, tier one status, uh, this is straight off of their website, there's an entire section on it. Uh, 
but it's talking about this founder's vision of turning this into a world-class institution. I think they're already there. Uh, you know, what we lack are a few things to, 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 to get the formal recognition as tier one. Uh, this is straight from their, their plan. Uh, they want to increase endowments to 400 million. Uh, they want to hire more tenured faculty. Um, they want to attract research funds to the point where they can expend 100 million a year on research. That's, that's a lot of money. Uh, they want to produce more doctoral graduates, and of course, they're looking for external recognition for scholarly attainment. Okay, so I mentioned Classroom of the Future. I'm going to hit on a few things briefly. Uh, we had a presentation done uh, in house as part of one of our lessons learned that was talking about uh, all of these different methodologies. But the days when you could build a room like this, or a room like a lot of what we have over at School of Management, where you have a podium and you have a bunch of seats and that's it. Uh, are, are rapidly uh, falling behind us. There's still a need, you know, that's why we built this room here, uh, there's still a need for this type of a, a venue, but for the most part we need interactive spaces where the furniture is mobile, we can move things around. There's a lot of things driving that. Uh, a lot of it is team-based learning, uh, competency-based curriculum, peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer and collaborative learning. Uh, one of the things, uh, the next slide shows an example of one of these scale-up spaces. Uh, but this, this room can be reconfigured in multiple ways that allows you to break off into small groups and, uh, and teach. Uh, a lot of the technology is going wireless. Uh, this is some interesting research that kind of drives the whole uh, reason for the changes in the way that we teach people, which is this top bar that says that when you use or teach information, you, you tend to retain it at a much higher rate than passively sitting in a lecture. So you guys should be up here helping me with this. <laughs> okay, so where do people learn? Uh, you know, that's changed a lot. Uh, my wife office is out of the home. I have a, a wireless laser printers at the house. In fact, I've got her set up so nicely I prefer to work at home than at campus. Uh, as soon as I figure out how to remotely manage construction from the house, I'll start doing that. Uh, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, but this shows where people are more comfortable, and uh, that's definitely changed uh, the ability to work remotely. Uh, and study and learn remotely is also affecting all of that. Okay, so what are we, what are we starting to see? How are we starting to see this effect in buildings? Well, if you have a chance to walk around the foyer in this building, you'll see lots of huddle spaces. Uh, you'll see lots of areas where you can have breakout sessions. Uh, one of the things that they love to do on this campus is take them outside. Uh, when we originally conceived of this building, one of the things we were talking about doing is actually have a setup where the, they could project projects on the outside of the building. Uh, what they ended up doing is this ble interior bleacher that you see over here that has projection capability. Uh, and then, of course, you have the, the lecture hall. But there's a lot more flexible spaces. There, uh, the trend to hardwire everything is going away. We're seeing a lot more uh, wireless. I mean. That's the first thing anybody asks when they run a hotel room, and the first thing they asked on campus is, where's the wireless and what's the passcode? Uh, so this was another, uh, these are just some quick diagrams that show some of the ways you can rearrange the same room quickly to adapt to what you're teaching uh, and to allow for these different types of teaching styles. Okay, so let me, uh, let me break off and talk about uh, recently completed projects. This, uh, I've been here since 2007, and that's pretty much where I picked up on this. Um, we, we've done a renovation of the Founders Building. Uh, we completed the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Lab in Searle. Uh, we did the first phase of the Campus Landscape Project, which is the front entryway and the mall all the way up to where the trellis is. Uh, we completed a Vivarium build-out in the basement of the in Searle Building. Uh, what's now called the SLIC, our Science Learning Center. Um, the Student Services Building addition, that was a big one. That was our first LEED building. We, got, uh, we, we actually successfully got LEED Platinum, which was the highest rating you can get on that. And that pulled people from all over campus and put them in one place and effectively created a one-stop shop. That building was actually funded partially through uh, increased user fees for the students, and it was put out for a vote. Would it be worth your time to be able to go to one place instead of 15 different buildings to do this? And that was actually successfully passed. Uh, we have a campus called, um, down closer to UT Southwest off of Mockingbird called the Center for Brain Health. We finished building out the second floor of that building. 
Okay, okay so, so 2011 to 2014, we did a, 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 some additional work in Founders. This building, the ATEC building, was completed. Uh, we built a new satellite energy plant, uh, which is right on the other side of the parking garage. We built the parking garage. We built a campus services and bookstore building, which is the visitor center that you see when you first come into campus. Uh, we completed the new addition to uh, school management for Dean Perkul. And we completed parking structure phase three. Uh, You'll notice that some of these projects are not sequential, and I'll get into that in a minute. That goes back to trying to adapt your plan when your master plan is obsolete by the time it's published. Okay, so uh, here's some area photos. The uh, building on the left, of course, is the one you're sitting in right now. Uh, ATEC building, a student services building. Uh, this is the uh, satellite energy plant, and then this is the parking garage that was built directly adjacent to it. It was actually designed by the uh, same engineering firm. By the way, that's the only building, that satellite energy plant is the only building on campus where I've got a building dedication plaque on it where the engineer is the prime and not the architect. And you know what we did to him? We made him put the plaque on the inside of the building. <laughs> There's a little passive aggression going on here. Okay, so this is a list of all the housing. Uh, again, getting back from the change from a commuter campus to more of a traditional campus, we want people to live here. And you know, one of the things that they've determined is we don't just need dormitories, we need what we now call living learning centers. They've determined that the, the odds of people successfully getting through their college career, if you can provide focused attention to them their freshman and sophomore year, is greatly increased. I don't have the statistics on it, but that's the model that's been used out here. Um, so, uh, it's basically four similar design dorms, and then the, recent, the one that was completed last summer, which was housing phase four, again out of sequence, uh, was 600 beds, included an 800 seat dining hall and a recreation center. Okay, so this shows you how fast all the stuff is going up. Uh, this use, if, if any of you are familiar with the campus, that used to be the old practice tee where you'd go out and drive golf balls. Uh, by the way, we were, when we were excavating for the foundations, we found golf balls two feet deep. And FM decided that that was pretty good topsoil, so we put it all over campus. So pretty much, we don't have to worry about Indian burial grounds here, but by golly, you're going to find golf balls. Okay, so, um, you know, again, I mentioned we're, we're doing all this very fast, and we're, we're adapting on the fly, and there's, there's a lot of things we could learn from that, but... What I want to focus on are, are, are two specific case studies in detail, and one I just want to talk to you about, which is this, uh, the MSET or Slick Building Project. Uh, we were doing foundation work, a pier drilling rig, drilled through a medium voltage duct bank, and knocked out power to about half the campus. Uh, we had emergency generators sitting all over the place. It took six weeks to get it back up in line. Uh, the reason I'm not going into detail on this one is this was, one was not hard to figure out. If you look at the photographs, you will see a manhole, and a manhole, and an exposed duct bank, and the drilling rig straddling the exposed duct bank. This is what happens when you take all of your management and you put them in a weekly construction meeting to tell the owner what's going on, and don't leave anybody out to manage the help. So that was completely avoidable, and obviously we no longer uh, allow them to have all of their supervision and all of their safety staff in our construction meetings. Okay, okay, so we had, a, uh, we had a similar project on housing phase two. Now, this one was a little bit different. We knew we had varied electrical duct banks. We did locates on it. But what we found out was, hey, they abandoned a duct bank, and they just came out five feet to the west of it and built a new one. And, of course, like all of our record drawings here, they're not just spot on. Uh, so we just managed to clip the corner of one of these duct banks uh, with one of the pier drilling rigs. And the pictures you'll see here are the damage. Now, we've already done this once, right? So we, we ought to have a pretty good contingency plan in place, and we ought to hopefully be able to shorten the duration of the impact. Uh, I can tell you this much. The good news was we only affected one building on this campus with this outage. It was the central energy plan. We couldn't make chill water, which means we shut the whole campus down. But it was only one building. Okay, I'm grasping at straws here, I admit it. Okay, so contributing factors, um, they didn't do adequate site utility excavation. Uh, they exposed the manhole, they exposed the duct bank in a few places, they assumed it was a straight line, it actually did this. Um, As-built records were inaccurate. Again, we turn over record drawings every time we start a new project, and the proviso is trust but verify. 
uh, and the, the verification process failed. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to, to work on that. Ground penning rate, penetrating radar um, is one of them. The ironic thing is, if you go back to this previous picture, um, notice that water in that hole? That water came from the electrical conduit that the electrical feeders were in. The groundwater table is so high at UT Dallas that a lot of our electrical infrastructure underground actually has water in it. So when these guys first hit this, they hadn't drilled through the duct bank, but water came up out of the hole. If they had alerted us, we could have went, you got a problem here, and probably stopped it. Okay, so back to our, our lessons learned. Uh, you know, obviously we need to do a better job of potholing. Uh, it's not cost effective to dig up the entire site down to a level of 17 feet, which was where this impact occurred, but we have to do a better job. Uh, and adequate supervision during drilling operations. If our superintendent had been there at the site, um, at that location when this happened, he probably could have stopped it. Okay, so what I wanted to also talk about was the FM response is, hey, we have an emergency response plan. We don't have to do a drill. We can actually test it. Uh, FM responded immediately getting emergency generators out for three other buildings that were affected when we changed the feeders to work on the one that was broken. Uh, it involved shedding some loads, it involved a, a quick contract repair process. What the contractor did um, that really, uh, really mitigated the damage was, first of all, they made sure everybody was safe. Nobody was hurt in this. Uh, they exposed the damaged duct back. They, they salvaged the feeders. The, the money for all that copper came back to the project. Uh, they had the duct back repaired in 48 hours. They had power restored in six days. Uh, and they maintained progress of construction, so that dorm project was delivered on time. So we still damaged the infrastructure, which is unacceptable, but fortunately we were able to mitigate the damage. And, you know, this, uh, Rick Dempsey tells me that's my two strikes, third one I'm out. Okay, so this one's more serious. Um, it affects this building. Um, back on July 7th of 2012, we had a tower crane collapse on this building while it was in construction, while it was being dismantled. Um, the, the part about this that was so disturbing is the, the high risk part of taking down a tower crane is removing the boom and the weights and the turntable assembly. That all went off without a hitch. Uh, but what happened is we had a storm blow in here and it was not a major storm, but uh, it did in fact cause the, the tower crane to collapse onto the building. Uh, we, were, we were fortunate in that it did not fall onto the adjacent McDermott Library, which it very well could have. It fell right on the construction site. It was completely constrained to the site. Uh, I don't think that was much of a comfort to the two workers who were tied off on the top section who were killed during the incident. Uh, this basically goes through the, the time frame on this. Um, we weren't allowed to officially talk about this until OSHA completed their investigation. That usually takes six months, and in fact, six months to the day we got a report out from them. But as a first responder, you know, I was one of the first people out on that scene after the emergency crews um, cleared the bodies and opened the site back up. And it was readily apparent when I got there what had caused the accident. And uh, it was just, it was completely avoidable. And I, just, I found myself being so angry at these two people that had done this because it, it didn't have to happen. And I, I, it affects them and it affects their family. And, you know, for me, this takes on a personal note. Um, I lost my first wife to a car accident in June of 2000. She was driving when she was anemic and wasn't supposed to be driving. And she wasn't wearing a seatbelt. It was completely avoidable. And I found myself going through that same anger grieving process that you go through. Uh, Again, nobody likes to talk about this, nobody likes to talk about bad things that have happened to them, but it is so, I can't express to you how important it is that, uncomfortable or not, it's important that we pass this stuff forward so that other people learn from their mistakes and don't repeat them. So the end result here was, uh, this was a BIM model diagram that, that uh, the contractor did to show how the, the crane collapsed, um, what really really shows you what happened here is these pictures. If you notice where the red arrows are, that's where the sections separated. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll notice the picture on the lower left here, those are bolts and they're stowed in carriers. They're stowed in carriers when the sections are removed and shipped from site. There's no way those bolts should have been removed until they were uh, 
it time, was time to take out the section. section. They, they were, were taking, taking out 20 foot sections at a time. So, so what, what happened? happened? Um, OSHA, OSHA came, came out with their inspection, inspection results. They, they don't actually share, share their investigation. They just publish a finding. The, the finding, finding was that Harrison Crane uh, was cited with six safety violations. The general contractor hunt construction was, was not held at fault, nor was OFPC or the campus held at fault. Uh, our safety programs um, and, and requirements actually exceed OSHA requirements. We, we consider that to be a minimum. Um, so if we did all that stuff, why did this happen anyway? Well, contributing factors. Um, before we do any kind of high-risk work on a construction project, we have the contractor prepare what's called a JHA, Job Hazard Assessment. They step by step describe the process they're going to be using to uh, take the crane down. In this case, uh, they noted that they were going to be loosening the bolts in preparation for taking the sections out. That is considered normal practice. What they did not tell us and what they did not disclose was that they were going to actually be removing bolts before taking the sections out. Uh, the dismantling crew members were considered the subject matter experts. Who knows better how to take down a or erect a tower crane, and somebody does it all the time. So they were assumed to know what they were doing. Um, the, the last one is what we call normalization of deviation. Uh, this one, plain and simple, is that you know they had been doing this for so long that it no longer seemed like it was dangerous. I mean, we do this all the time. I was standing there with the ocean inspector, where the superintendent told him, said, "Yeah, we took those bolts out. We do that all the time." So, you know, how does it get to this point? Uh, it, it almost becomes cultural. You, you cut corners, and, uh, and so you don't, you don't realize what's going on. Okay, so you know, what have we done to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen, not just here, but on any other UT system project? Um, we still review the JHAs. Uh, we're especially now looking for shortcut practices. I, I've been involved in high-rise construction for most of my working career never even occurred to me that anybody would do something like this just out of a sense, healthy sense of self-preservation. Um, we now have a third-party crane inspection service who are subject matter experts. They come out here and supervise both the erection and dismantling of our tower cranes. Um, and we have, uh, as I mentioned, it's painful to, to discuss this stuff with other people, but we've made sure that it's been shared system-wide. Uh, and so this third-party crane inspection service is being done statewide now on all of our projects. So it will not happen again. Uh, shouldn't happen the first time. Um, but again, this is back to what we were talking about earlier. When you're moving at the rate of speed that, that we're moving, uh, your risks go up. And so you have to pay a lot more attention to, to risk mitigation. And you know we've got all the, the terminology and the buzzwords, but we're talking about you know people that don't go home to their families here. So you know, Dr. Kennerly had, had, had talked about earlier uh, you know, that photo of the Murrow building, you know, bringing it down to a personal level. Yes, it's great to use PMI technology or terminology and to be systematic about how we do this, but don't forget what it's all about. And, you know, in their case, it's sending patients home uh, safely at the end of the day. And in our, you know, our, our project here is to send every one of those workers home safely at the end of the day. Okay, okay, so uh, uh, let's get on to something a little lighter. Uh, current construction projects, what we have in, uh, in progress right now is the uh, Bioengineering Sciences Building. This has also been called NSERL 2. Uh, it's being built just south of the existing Natural Sciences and Engineering Building. We're doing, uh, we just started a, a, a Callier Richardson expansion uh, to the Callier Building on the north side of campus. Uh, the campus landscape uh, project, McCarthy is working through the center of campus all the way up the admin building. We'll actually be opening that area up so the entire mall from the center drive to the admin building will be open within the next week, week and a half. Thank you, Jesus. Um, we're, we are also tearing up a lot of other areas on the campus. That's the bad news. Um, we, uh, all I can say is get used to chain link. Uh, student Services Building Edition. We did such a fine job on the Student Services Building that two years after we moved everybody in, it was full. So we're now building an addition to that. Uh, well, beginning construction soon. We have a new building uh, off of Mockingbird that will be the uh, Brain Performance Institute next to the Center for Brain Health and the uh, Davidson Gundy Alumni Center. And guess what alumni centers are funded with? Alumni gifts. Shameless plug. Sorry, Jim. Okay, uh, this is a rendering of the uh, Bioengineering and Sciences Building. Uh, this is due to be substantially complete in October. We'll be doing furniture fit out and move in um, up into uh, November, and they should be moving strong on the uh, on this 
taking ownership of this. As you can see, large project, the total project cost is 113 million, roughly 223,000 square feet. And let me see if I can get, um, yeah, here's some progress photos. Uh, we have uh, a service that does aerial photography on all of our major projects. It really helps us communicate the progress to our client. We also tend to inundate them with PDFs of photographs. And let me see if I can get this video to play properly. Okay, okay, this was something that uh, the contractor on the Bioengineering Sciences Building is Beck Group, and uh, they're, they're doing a great job. In fact, Beck was the one that completed the School of Management expansion as well. And uh, what they've been doing is playing around with drones. Uh, actually, what they've been doing is crashing drones. I think they've destroyed four of them. Uh, they finally caved in, went to their corporate office, and found somebody who actually knew how to do this and brought him back down, and, and he did this montage um, of uh, different shots flying over the building. And uh, this is fascinating. Uh, you know, the current aerial photography that we have done here is done by helicopter once a month. They come out and carpet bomb the whole campus and then uh, build individual jobs. But the ability to do this, and not just during construction, but if I need to inspect something and I don't have a 60 foot boom lift out here, we can actually, uh, you know, use technology like this to inexpensively uh, find stuff out. And um, when, when one of these little Drones crashes in the parking lot. We, we don't have a major OSHA investigation, at least yet. We may have the FAA after us. But, uh, <laughs> remains to be seen. Okay, so here's some renderings of the uh, landscape enhancement project. This is the area north of the trellis up to the admin building I was talking about. Um, if you get a chance to walk through that area when it opens in the next week or two, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, these are some progress photos. Uh, that project has been plagued by any number of, uh, of problems, uh, a lot of it outside of their contractor's control. 70 weather days related to rain. Has it rained here? had not recently. Uh, they've made more progress in the last two months than they did the first six. Uh, the other thing we did is we like to minimize the impact to the staff and students when we do really loud demolition work. So facilities management made the decision to have a demo contractor come in and do all the demolition work from the trellis up to the admin building over Christmas. Well, we didn't have and the drawings complete and didn't have the contractor online until August of that same year. So the president, every morning, looks out of his office and sees this big mud pit. This is not going to end well for, for many of us. Uh, I'm so glad we finally got that area opened. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Daniels has moved on become the Deputy Vice Chancellor of UT System. Hopefully we didn't drive him off because of this project. Okay, uh, this is the Callier Center expansion. This is a uh, clinical space and office space. Uh, interesting project. We're just coming out of the ground with that. Um, it's uh, directly uh, south of the current Callier uh, project, which is on the north side of campus. And uh, these are just some construction progress photos. Uh, we had a lot of back, uh, excavation and uh, foundation work. They're currently doing grade beams piers. They've completed site utility work. Okay, student services building edition. This is uh, J.E. Dunn's, our contractor. This one just started. Uh, they, in fact, they're, they're just starting to do demo work out there. It's going to be a great building. Uh, this is building on the uh, similar styles and formats, although it's a different architect than the one that did the original building. Uh, parking structure four. Well, let's see, we talked about parking structure one and three. How did we end up at four? What happened to two? Well, in fact, that thing's changing quickly. There's an asphalt lot on the west side of student housing phase three that was supposed to be the location of parking structure two, which is now taken on a life of its own and morphed into this monstrosity, which is going to be just adjacent to the conference center. Uh, actually, this had more to do with it, with all the parking that's been built on the north side of campus by housing. They really didn't need another parking garage there. So we repurposed it, went back to the board, got approval for additional funds, and the result is going to be this parking garage. Uh, this is actually going to be really handy because we have the parking structure one over here on this end, and then this one will be uh, adjacent to the main core campus. So hopefully you won't be walking as far. Uh, that and if you've noticed, they're paving every patch of grass they can find right now uh, as fast as they can. Uh, the ironic thing about it is we don't actually have a parking shortage. We have a perceived parking shortage, and that's what we're paving for. Uh, back to planning, master planning, and uh, master planning being obsolete before it's uh, 
the ink is dry. Uh, I didn't have time to go into the different master plans that have been done by architects on this campus over the years, but the one I found the most interesting was 1971. There was a rendering showing a monorail coming down between Green Hall and uh, uh, Johnson Center. And uh, apparently we are we have dropped the ball on the Disneyfication of UT Dallas. But uh, yeah. And the ironic thing is, one of my PMs used to work for Disney, so I, we're without excuse. So I, I think we're just, uh, like I said, rolling with what, what we're given. Okay, so upcoming projects. I mentioned the Brain Performance Institute, uh, the, the Davidson Gundy Alumni Center. Uh, we're working in programming on a large engineering building. Uh, we were hoping to receive funding for a science building. Uh, that's in programming as well. Uh, we don't know whether that project's actually going to be funded or not. Uh, campus infrastructure and road improvements was also uh, work that needed to be done over on the east side of campus. It's uh, in programming only because a funding source hasn't been identified. And then the next housing project, housing phase six, which is actually planned to be graduate uh, uh, efficiency in one and two bedroom apartment style housing. Uh, I don't, I have some pictures of this, I don't have pictures of a lot of it because the uh, Board of Regents doesn't like us showing renderings of projects that aren't actually on the capital improvement program. So, uh, this is the Center for Brain Health, the uh, uh, architect um, on this one is Jacobs. The, uh, let's see, where is it? yeah, here we go. So this is a $29 million project, roughly 61,000 square feet. Uh, it's going to be a really interesting space. Again, this is, uh, uh, Adjacent to the Center for Brain Health down on Mockingbird, uh, Mockingbird it's uh, conceived to address uh, diminishing cognitive brain power across the lifespan that affects every sector of society. I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure they'll let me know. Actually, I, I, I tripped over the 50 line a few years ago, so I shouldn't be making jokes about uh, cognitive. No, never mind. Okay, so upcoming construction projects. Uh, I mentioned the Alumni Center. Uh, this is a $10 million TPC. Uh, we're actually hoping to get that up to $15 million. Uh, that will be uh, substantially complete in 2017. Engineering building uh, substantially complete in 2018. Uh, science building, again, funding has been identified. Uh, it's a roughly $95 million project as currently conceived. Uh, student housing phase four would be complete by uh, July of 2017. Uh, it's roughly 46 million. Uh, again, apartment style residence hall, uh, mix of efficiency, one bedroom, two bedroom. And the current site they're looking at is just south of the uh, apartments uh, along Waterview. Okay, so future projects, you know, stuff that's not yet on the CIP, uh, new student union building, um, a art laboratory, an exposition building, they actually want a place to do the wet art and display it. This building was actually an interesting uh, experiment. Uh, they wanted to, to take our computer programmers uh, and, and computer uh, tech, techno dweebs and combine them with the traditional wet arts, sculpture, painting, uh, pottery, all that kind of stuff, and have them all play in one area. And uh, I, I think it's actually been fascinating because one of the things they're, they're trying to do here uh, is address one of the things that happens is, you know, you study in your major and then you go out in the working world and what do they do? They put you on a project team made up of diverse people with diverse backgrounds and you haven't learned how to, you know, you haven't learned how to work with a diverse group. They're starting to address that not just in, in the internship programs now, but the way that they teach. And I think it's an excellent idea. And that also goes back to what we were talking about earlier is this whole idea that if you have people you know, engaged in their own learning process by teaching their peers and teaching each other, they tend to retain the information a lot more. Um, I'm, I'm a lead accredited professional. Uh, I, I took it early on when they first came out with that accreditation. Uh, lead is leadership and energy uh, uh, design. It's designed to basically get architects to do what we used to do before we had air conditioning systems, with, which would design buildings with natural light and uh, the natural ventilation. Uh, when we found out we could air condition everything and artificially light it, we, we kind of got sloppy. And so that whole program was designed to kind of transition us back to being more responsible and energy efficient about the way that we design things. Well, when I took that test, it was read the book, spit it out, and you get your accreditation. Well, that's great. Now, can you apply it? Well, I can now three or four lead projects later. but. The USGBC actually paid attention to that and they modified their test and to where they're now part of what you're doing on the exam to get a credit is not just do you know it, but you know how to apply it. And that really is, really is what it comes down to. I think a lot of us when we were in college originally thought that, oh, you get a degree in something, you go work in that field and that's, that's it, you're done. 
and what you know whether we like it or not we are in an environment that requires lifelong learning i mean college is just the first step it teaches you to, uh, to you know, know how to assimilate knowledge and then how to apply it to solving problems uh, i learned how to draft beautifully on a drafting table i got to do it for 11 months and i came into the office one morning and it's like there's a drafting table's gone and there's a computer on the desk I'm like, what do i do with this thing what do you draw with it I'm like okay i guess i'm going back to school uh, you know, I had to learn AutoCAD, I had to learn a lot of the stuff. Once I learned it and realized how much more efficient it was, I embraced it. Back to the, what I was talking about earlier with the charter, project charter. When you really understand it and the capabilities, then, then it's easier to even get yourself to buy in on it. But uh, uh, again, uh, back to what I was talking about here, the, the whole concept here is, is we're trying to build a university here where we're training and developing a not just people that know how to work properly, but leaders. Um, you know, I've, I've always wanted to be a good manager, but I also want to be a leader. I want to be the kind of person that people will follow because they want to, not because they got a gun to their head. Uh, you know, being a leader requires a whole different skill set uh, than, than just simply being a good manager, being technically proficient. There's a, uh, another session going on during this conference where they talk about the change in the PMP professional uh, education requirement. To, to cover these modules on uh, strategic thinking and on leadership and also technical skills. I think that's really, really a good idea. And it's also directly addressing what employers are telling us that they want to see. Uh, school of management is another uh, area where they've employed a lot of subject matter experts. They may not have PhDs. They may be like me that, that simply have a bachelor's degree, but they've got 30 years of hard learned experience. And that's the kind of experience that that is invaluable as far as teaching other people. So, you know, my initial complaint about my education as an architect, and this isn't a slam against Texas A&M, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm really conflicted. I work for UT System. I married a Longhorn, too. It just goes downhill from there. Uh, but, but at any rate, this idea that you, you get a degree and you're done, and, you know, uh, I don't know that they necessarily taught me that. I may have just made that decision, but this idea that, yeah, this is your first step on a lifelong journey, embrace it, uh, and use this to, to move on to, to bigger and better things. Or, or used to work for your, your biggest football rival. Okay. Uh, so, anyway, the, what, I'm, I'm going to try to wrap it up here. Uh, I didn't mention that I don't have ADD, but I'm willing to learn. Uh, we've got some other existing building renovations that we're looking at. Uh, the McDermott Library is desperately in need of renovations. Green Hall as well. Uh, Callier Richardson South, once we finish the new addition, we're going to start looking at ways to, to renovate that. Uh, infrastructure improvements, you know, nobody wants to go out and say, ribbon cutting, look at our buried electrical feeders. Uh, unfortunately, you know, You've got to put the infrastructure in place uh, in order to support the buildings. And that's why we built this uh, satellite utility plant, and which unfortunately is already uh, too small. Uh, there's a lot of lessons learned looking backwards. It's a whole lot easier to plan when you go, wow, you know, we probably shouldn't have done that. But let me give you an example. We have four of the five dorms we built are identical designs with the, apart uh, the architect direct appointed to adapt it to different sites. The reason that was done is enrollment went up. We went, oh, gosh. We need another dorm and we need it open by next summer. Well, there's only one way to do that. Direct appoint the architect and then give the contractor um, 10 to 11 months to build the entire project. So we went through that four times. The reason phase four finished last was after phase three, the light bulb went off and said, maybe we ought to plan better. Let's get out ahead of this and see if we can do a bigger dorm. Well, the bigger dorm went out with a new architect, so we didn't get it done one year. We got it done two. So we actually leapfrogged it with dorm five because that same growth rate was going up. Uh, you know, in hindsight, probably would have made more sense to build a new central plan out there just for the housing area. But you can't make the business case for it until the need exists. And that's one of the inherent struggles to doing this kind of master planning is to justify the business case for building the central plant, you need the dorms. Well, if the dorms are put in, then you don't need the infrastructure because you've got independent chillers and boilers and you know that just means that you're running less efficient buildings so you know there's still a lot of ground to cover to, to get to a place where we feel like we're planning better uh, i know i've hit you guys with a lot of information uh you know this is what happens when debbie uh, asks for volunteers okay so 
if I can, if I can summarize this, um, we're going to, you know, my organization is going to continue to try to respond to the rapid growth here uh, by working with the university, working with any users to, to plan, and, uh, and, and you know, obviously, I think right now we're overdue for uh, a master plan. Although I think they ought to bring the monorail idea back. I really think that would be fun. Um, I just ride it around campus all day. Uh, nobody would be able to find me that way. Uh, application of lessons learned, again, you know, it's, it's not fun airing your own dirty laundry, but at a certain point, it's absolutely critical that you pay for what you learn so that other people don't have to learn it the same hard way that you did. Uh, I went through this becoming a parent. I was bound and determined not to make any of the same mistakes that my, my dad made. I didn't. I made a whole different set. Uh, you know, in fact, that's, I think that's why whenever my kids pulled a walker on me, I would call my dad and tell him about it so he could gloat. I, I call it parental penance. Uh, again, the primary driver right now, besides the fact that we're offering a quality education here, is, is simply that we are pursuing a tier one status. I think you're going to see the university achieve that in the near future. Uh, it's an exciting place to be, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys about this. And maybe in a, a couple of years, if I haven't thoroughly jaded Jim, I can come back and talk to you about where we are then. Thank you. I can answer some questions. You want to ask him some questions? How many, uh, since in, you're being so transparent, which I appreciate, uh, how often do you have to dip in the contingency, give money back, and what do you do with those seven, 70 days of non-work? Well, first of all, don't mistake lack of discretion for transparency. <laughs> uh, conting managing contingency is, is a tightrope. Uh, obviously, uh, well, I used the Dean for Cool example. He wanted the maximum building he could get for his money. And the only place for that money to come from was contingency. Uh, on the other hand, I have to have an adequate contingency to manage unforeseen site conditions, inevitable owner changes, uh, and things like that. Um, so it is really kind of a balancing act. Uh, there have been a few projects where we have given back quite a bit of money to the university at the end of the project uh, at the expense of less teaching space or less scope. That's not good either. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't really have a, a, I don't really have a simple answer for that. We try to keep our contingencies reasonable. We use an approach of a phase down buyout or phase down use of contingency as the risk. Uh, decreases and uh, you know, in fact I've got a chart I could show you on how that works but typically with a construction project your highest risk is when you're coming out of the ground particularly out here uh, you never know what you're gonna find uh, so far no unexploded ordinances uh, or, or cemeteries uh, we have as I mentioned found a few golf balls but that, that's the that's probably the biggest challenge right there is just simply getting through that uh, once we've gotten the foundation done the site utilities done we're coming up out of the ground there's a lot less risk in a typical project, new ground up project. Now, if we're doing an addition to a building where we're having to tie in, uh, there's some, some changes there. But So we'll do a phase drawdown of contingency. Uh, and the, and the, the uh, School of Management was the best example I can give you. When we got to a certain point, I could safely tell my client, yeah, I think we can afford to buy out some of the space uh, and, and go ahead and pay the contractor to do that. So it's definitely in our best interest to carefully steward and manage the risk but we also need to give the university and the staff of students here as much building for the money as we can. So, uh, Lindsay mentioned something about uh, the risk. I mean, uh, when stuff goes wrong, you know, uh, the campus doesn't have uh, power for almost seven days, you know, the construction work, the loss of life as well. So, how are such what is the aftermath, and what happens next? Uh, is, is there like, was at the corporate level, you know, there might be something to point in, hey, you did something wrong, so how, how, what happens next, and how was that situation? Well, I'm still here, who knows, <laughs> so far. Uh, no, it's a good question. Um, we have multiple uh, emergency response people involved here. You know, you have to get it together as a group. Um, the, using the crane uh, as an example, we had daily meetings seven days a week for two weeks. Well, I mean, we had lawyers, we had insurance people, we had uh, 
you know, just just about virtually everyone involved at the upper echelons of this campus involved in those meetings while we worked through uh, the process. The ATIC building was a good example. What, we didn't just have to deal with the initial problem. I had to keep the building moving. I had to get the building finished. So we had to minimize the delay time. Uh, and we also had to do an impact analysis to see how badly the building had been damaged. Um, there was actually a structural steel element uh, shade screen on the north side of the building that acted like a shock absorber and, and pretty much prevented major damage to the building. Uh, the contractor was able to reorder steel from existing shop drawings and we were able to uh, minimize the risk. I think we still lost six weeks on the schedule uh, due to that. But, uh, uh, that, that's, that's okay. again, it's, it's not, not just dealing with the initial emergency. emergency. You, you still have to finish the building. You still have to keep the project going. And so, so you're, you're kind, kind of having to, to balance both of those things at the same time. Anybody else? I have one for you. you have a, how many campuses does UT have? Uh, we have a total of, total of 15. 15? Yeah. So how, much, how difficult is it to get approval and, and how much infighting goes on? Uh, you got you got, you got a couple hours. Uh, the the capital improvement program. Uh, the, the way that we get a new project on on the capital improvement program is the university identifies a need. Okay, I need my, my school management's full. We're making a lot of money. We're selling. We're, we're getting a lot of people in here. I need the space. I, I can make the business case for it. They actually put together a business plan, and then we'll take that business plan down and and use that as part of the getting the project on the Board of Regents Capital Improvement Program. Once that happens, we can spend up to 10% of the approved cost up through design development. At design development, we go back with some of these renderings that you've seen, and we do a presentation to the board. If they approve it from that point on, we can finish the design and get the construction built. But uh, you always have to identify the funding, and uh, I could talk to you for an hour on just the different funding mechanisms they have. And I won't. <laughs> hey Vince. Yes, sir. So first, for some alumni, so thanks for all the good work you're doing around improving the campus. But, uh, but just don't look too close. <laughs> you, you talked about uh, the opportunity to have a learning environment. I think you have a uniqueness with having the OFPC here on campus with what we're doing with the PM program, I guess. Maybe talk about how you leverage those stakeholders, how you include them. Are you doing anything with the program as well as what you're doing um, with the I've had the privilege of uh, being a guest lecturer at one of Jim, uh, excuse me, Jim Zott's courses. Uh, I did a class last December on project initiation, and it was kind of half PMI and half lessons learned from projects that we've done out here. Um, I've also spoken at the Applied Project Management Forum. Uh, you know, I've always liked this idea of educating other people. I really like the idea of, of people not having to learn from mistakes the same way I did. And again, I know everybody makes their own mistakes anyway. But, uh, you know, this, I guess the one thing I would say is uh, I feel the need to give back. Uh, and there's lots of opportunities through the Dallas chapter, through this university, to do just that. And I would highly encourage anyone to take the time to put together a presentation and submit it. Uh, AP, the Applied Project Management Forum is always looking for good speakers.